So now I'm more and more exploring, and I don't think I'm on the leading edge at all, but trying to get towards that end of the spectrum. Yeah, you're on the train, and it's good that you're uh, you're making hay with it from uh, with your clients. That's good. Exactly. Welcome to the Digital Accomplice Podcast. Today I'm here with Dennis Shaw from the marketing agency Attention Retention. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Dane. Yeah, glad you're here. So um, I like to start out with something nice and easy. What would be for you a recent content marketing success you've enjoyed? Recent cut. Let's see. Uh, well, we both connected in the Content Marketing Institute Slack <clears throat> community, and I've been doing a little bit of writing for uh, Content Marketing Institute. So technically, this isn't pure content marketing. It's more of writing about content marketing. <laughs> um, but I've recently written a couple of articles for the site. Uh, the topics include influencer marketing, um, using a hook for your marketing, um, and what else? And a couple of other uh, topics. It's largely based on talks that were hosted at the 2023 Content Marketing World Conference. OK, awesome. That sounds, sounds like some cool stuff. Yeah. The um the flip side of that would be the challenges that you're facing. <laughs> what would you say is like your biggest uh, content marketing challenge you're facing right now? Huh. I think it's not, it's both a challenge and an opportunity, and I'm sure it's something that is on almost all of our minds, which is AI. So I've had a multi phased ex um, experience with AI. The initial phase was a little bit of awe and worry which was, uh, this was when ChatGPT came out. I think that was fall of 2022. Um, and that was, wow, this is amazing. And wow, is this going to impact um, the role of marketers or even more specifically the role of writers? Um, that's phase one. Uh, and I kind of just was curious with the technology. So I, I focused mainly on ChatGPT, although I know there's many other tools out there. Uh, phase two, I think that's the phase I'm in now. So I kind of, in phase one, I played with the tool and I said I, I should get uh, familiar with what it's capable of, um, but I was fearful. I think phase two is I'm seeing a lot of other marketers use the technology in ways that I never expected. So really creative ways. And what I love to do is just see. So sometimes it's either an article or a talk that I attend and they, they go through a specific, a detailed uh, demo or, or a detailed journey on how they're using it generative AI. And then I say, wow, that's so neat. And I try it myself. So I'll try it either. Sometimes I'll like do it, try it out on a cl an actual client project. So it's like real work. Other times I'll just play, do it for fun just to try out what they're, what they're doing. So now I'm in a phase of, I still have general concerns about the technology overall, as far as like the big stuff, what is it going to mean for humans? <laughs> but I am now embracing the power and using it for, pro for productive gains in my work. And now I'm, I, I'm feeling more comfortable because if I can use it effectively, I have a better chance of staying relevant to clients by demonstrating how to use it for productivity. So now I'm, I'm more and more exploring and tr tr I don't think I'm on the leading edge at all, but trying to get towards that end of the spectrum. Yeah, you're on the train and it's good that you're, uh, you're making hay with it from, uh, with your clients. That's good. Exactly. Yeah. So um, what would you say you have been doing with video uh, in, in your content marketing and sort of what would you like to be doing but, but haven't gotten to yet with video? I think this is a little bit more, I'm going to answer more from a personal point of view and almost like personal branding as opposed to video in client projects. Uh, but what I found is the, so I, I will occasionally post to LinkedIn both for to promote something like an event coming up or even like a client's webinar. But I also like to, to um, share useful information that my connections on LinkedIn will find valuable. And like posts will cut, will uh, perform uh, like on different ends of the spectrum. But what consistently works is video. And it's as simple as just using some uh, like a plugin to record myself on webcam, just like we're kind of speaking on video right now, but you might not, we might just hear, be hearing the audio, but anyway, really a low budget, low, uh, low ease or a high ease. <laughs> and I'm just saying something. So it could, and I try to keep it short. So maybe 60 minutes or less. And what I'm really doing is I'm still sharing something. So I might share, uh, I run a meetup, so I might share a link to next week's meetup. 
But instead of writing it and posting it to LinkedIn, I record the short video. I still, of course, write a post, but those um, LinkedIn posts perform way in a different level than the, t the non-video posts. So it's really an easy, uh, I think it's something I would recommend for people to do on LinkedIn. But what I'm not doing is any high production quality video because all I'm doing is recording myself. I don't do any editing and just upload it. Uh, what I haven't done is, and I have some friends who've told me about certain tools at uh, like SaaS based editing tools, and I haven't tried any of that. So I think I would like to explore higher quality video with uh, graphics and other uh, bells and whistles. Yeah, definitely. Okay. That's interesting. I'm glad it's working for you and that you've got, um, you know, some other things you're eyeing as well. Um, yeah. So we touched on this a little bit, but I do like to stick to the same questions every time um, sure. about what you're doing with AI uh, sure. and sort of what's what's working <laughs> and what's not. So maybe we can yeah. kind of get a little bit more granular or um, or even more general about um, what's working and what's not with AI. Sure. Um, I think when AI first surfaced, um, like largely with when ChatGPT came out, a lot of the common sense use that marketers thought of was to create copy, to easily create copy, or like you might use a cliche, like create copy at scale, which I think is the wrong thing to do. Uh, and I've had some debates with people where they want to fill their content calendar using ChatGPT or a similar tool. And that really, I don't like that concept because you're just taking the average of what's already been written on the web and you're just regurgitating that average. And it's really just, another form of what's already been out there. And I don't think that serves anyone well in terms of content, because I like the concept of having a fresh perspective that maybe hasn't been shared before, something that Google hasn't even indexed. I think that's where you're gonna make a difference in going forward. Um, so that's, I think, an area that I, it can do it pretty well. Honestly, generative AI can create content pretty well. But I like to look at areas where it's not, you're not using it to create content. You're using it more as an assistant to do things like analysis and recommendations. So there's one case, I saw a presentation of a marketer who is taken, so this is pretty complex, but I was, I was like, wow, I can do this. It would, he would export data from Google Search Console. So it's like a, a spreadsheet format. He would upload it to ChatGPT and say, can you process this? ChatGPT says, yes. So it's things like um, in keyword data with impressions, click-through rate, et cetera. And he would ask it something like, look for cases where the click-through rate is lower than you would expect it to be and optimize the um, headline for me. And so it got back a set of recommendations. He would review it. Some of it, he'd be like, nah, that doesn't quite work. And then others, he, he would say, wow, that's, I hadn't thought of that, that's good. So it's just an amazing way to take data, have it process the data, and give you ways that you might be able to optimize your page for better SEO. Interesting. So pretty yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty cool how people are using it in different ways. Um, and yeah, inspiring and scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so when it comes to taking all this content that we're making and repurposing it, uh, what would you say you're doing uh, with repurposing content and what's working there and maybe what's not? I think what's working is I don't think enough marketers maximize the potential of repurposing, or they might not even be doing it in the first place. I, so if you take, if in general, if you take the more complex asset, so I think of a white paper or a webinar as fairly complex, white, white paper might be 10, 20 pages, sometimes even more. It's got a lot of content, charts, visuals, et cetera. Webinar is usually, let's say, an hour long, and it's got an associated slide deck. Those are things that can be chopped up in ways that are pretty easy to do. So a white paper, you might chop it up into some blog posts. Using that content, you probably don't want to just do a straight, uh, literally chopping up a section and posting the, that exact copy, but you can use it to inform a blog post series. You can take some of the, maybe the charts in, and visuals in the white paper and create an infographic. You can also create a lot of different assets to promote people to register or download the white paper. On the webinar, you can do li little video excerpts. So you can take a little one minute um, insightful quote from the speaker and use that on social media. 
you can take the slide deck and upload it to certain sites. There used to be a popular site called, I mean, it still exists, a site, site called SlideShare, but you can take the deck and put it there. Um, so there's really easy ways to do it. So I think the, the one opportunity is that we are, a lot of marketers aren't doing it to the maximum extent they, they could. It's really an easy way to create more content and find people who might prefer to consume content in different ways. So like someone who doesn't want to read your white paper might choose to um, look at a series of your LinkedIn posts that relate to the white paper. And then what was the second part of the question? What What's, what's, what's not working? What's, what's, what's not working, working and what's not with repurposing? I think what doesn't work in repurposing is when you don't, uh, not every platform or channel, they, they each have unique things about it so that if you take something and don't optimize it for that channel, it can come off as not natural organic to that channel. Right. Yeah. Good, good advice. So uh, with all this uh, repurposing that's happening, we, are, we, we have to measure that too. So what are you doing with uh, measuring your content performance and what's working there and what's not? Well, as, it, if, as far as measurement, as it relates to repurposing, it's, I think it's all the same measurement, which is you've got you've, you to get the measurement right. And I think it often has to relate to translating business goals. So kind of like big picture, what is the business trying to achieve? and then mapping that to sp specific metrics that you can measure. Uh, sometimes that's tricky and so because sometimes there's not a straight line from say revenue to how do you measure content on your website to, and map that to revenue. So you, you've got to figure out a way how to stitch different measurements together. Um, but once you have a measurement in place, then the beauty of repurposing is that all the, let's say you've turned one asset into 10, you're measuring those 10 assets within the same framework. So it's just a matter of tracking the contribution of those 10, as opposed to just tracking the one, because you, the 10 is a result of you doing the repurposing. But I would argue it still should be all within the same central uh, KPI reporting process. Right. Okay. So then, um, if we kind of take everything we just talked about and turn that into like your one golden takeaway, what would you be your biggest piece of marketing, uh, content marketing advice for content marketers out there? Uh, if you allow me to cheat, I'm actually going to say something that's not precisely based on what I had just said, but I think the, the big thing for me is a extreme focus on your audience, because I think all too often we're thinking about many different things. We might be thinking about like, the specific format, like I need to do five blog posts this quarter, or I need to do more video this quarter. That could be the case, but we don't spend enough time really obsessing over the audience because that is whom we're trying to satisfy with all of our content. Uh, so something as simple as spending more time with your target audience, it could be your customers, it could be prospects, it could be um, family members who happen to fit your customer persona. Uh, we should be speaking to them more. We should be spending more time with them to understand, almost like going through a day to day, their day, like going through their daily routine, even if it doesn't relate to the context of what you provide, you should still understand what they're doing throughout the day. Um, so I like to use the phrase that you should know your audience better than they know themselves, if that's possible. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that's great advice. Wouldn't we all love to know that? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's sage advice. Um, uh, thank you for that, uh, Dennis. And, uh, you know, thanks again for coming on the, the show today. Uh, it was sure a thing. pleasure having you on. Thank you.